Give me a high five, bro. I know you want to. Oh my god. Look at that. I raised this beautiful creature myself in captivity. Today, I'm going to show you one of the bigger species of Rostelia moth. Rostelia triloba, a species from Central America. I'm going to show you how you can raise them in captivity. Now, Rostelia moths are pretty interesting. In total, there are about 40 species of these guys. And they come in many shapes and colors. Some of them, to be honest, are pretty small or medium sized. But other ones, like this one, can become pretty huge. And to be honest, I like big moths. So this species was missing on my channel and today I'm going to show you Rostelia triloba. Let's get started. Now, rearing Rostelia triloba is not so difficult. The hardest part is finding eggs of these moths, somehow. The first instar of this species is social, and the babies feed together in groups. In captivity, the babies are quite easily raised on a very broad range of host plants. For example, they love ligustrum or privet, prunus or cherry, salix or willow, liquid amber or sweet gum, Schinus molle or Peruvian pepper tree, potentially also Hedera helix or ivy, and to be honest, a lot more plants. In captivity, the babies should be raised in humid plastic boxes. In star number three or four, can be moved from these boxes into bigger and more ventilated spaces. The second instar of Triloba is interestingly very bluish. At least the ground color of the caterpillars appears to be rather blue, which is somewhat of a rare color to see in caterpillars. They seem to be growing quite well on privet. I even was so courteous to spray them with water once in a while to give them a drink, but still the caterpillars are thirsty animals actually. The development was going well and I had little losses. Okay, so quite clearly these beautiful little buggers are doing well with their bluish greenish colors and here I have a whole container full of them can you see it it's uh, full of healthy little caterpillars look at that how many there are but uh, they are outgrowing the container and if I keep them like this then they're not going to live for long Cat these caterpillars need a lot of space they are going to grow very big in a short time Put some host plants in an empty soda can filled with water 
and included some host plant. This is how I raise my caterpillars uh, preferably. When they grew too large for my small box, I placed them into this big cage. The caterpillars of Triloba grow quite large, so to accommodate them, we need a fair amount of space. The food plant I gave them here was new. It was bird cherry or prunus padus, mixed with privet or ligustrum. It seems the caterpillars were quite pleased with their new surroundings. In instar number three, they gain their typical green coloration and furry stomachs. My larvae seem to be very fond of the flowers of the bird cherry plants that are blooming. Flowers are highly nutritious and when I can, I always try to feed my caterpillars the flowers if they are available. As time went by, the larva gradually grew much larger and consumed large amounts of cherry leaves until finally they started shedding their skins to the fourth instar. Sometimes I spray the caterpillars with water to drink. I generally do not recommend spraying caterpillars, but the Rostelia moth can be an exception for they are thirsty animals sometimes. This species lives in more humid environments. They seem to like it once in a while. Make sure the water can dry up and that the larvae are not permanently wet. Here's our caterpillar so far. They are instar 3 and 4, looking excellent aren't they? Farming moths is a lot of work, believe it or not. Uh oh. I dropped it on the floor, so I'm probably going to have to drink this one. Oh, that's not so bad. This sums up my life perfectly. <laughs> it's all foam. What's up kids, it's time to show the progress of the caterpillars here. Ah, excuse me for drinking alcohol on YouTube. It's the first sunny day in spring, okay? I'm not an alcoholic and it was an emergency. Really? See, I don't lie to you. Anyway, today we're going to look at the caterpillars here. Um, so let's see how we're going to do that. Just let Put the camera here. Perfect. Whoosh. Oh my gosh. This is incredible. This is incredible result. Now, I want you to take a good look here at these caterpillars. As you can see, they are absolutely huge. And this is just the smallest of them. Wow. Let's see if we can find the biggest of them. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Take a look. Uh, anyways, I am otherwise very pleased with the result. I mean, just look at this caterpillar here. How could I possibly not be pleased with this result? 
Hostelia orizaba is an amazing species. And this caterpillar is still eating. So it's uh, it's not going to make a cocoon just yet. But uh, give it about one week maybe. One week before it starts spinning its, uh, its cocoon. Because I, I can't imagine this, this one being that far away from pupation to be honest. And neither can I imagine the rest of them. I haven't counted how many I have left. Last time, time we counted 11 individuals, but I think two of them have died. So we may be down to nine individuals. Mm, that's not a lot, but I also didn't have a lot of eggs to begin with. So I don't like doing mass breedings. I like rearing small amounts just to study them. That's the trick to keeping many species at the same time is not to, to raise too many of the same species, you know. I like to keep some diversity in there for YouTube. And uh, Oritzaba is generally easy to breed if you have basic experience with uh, Saturnids. You can give them cherry, you can give them sweet gum, liquid amber, prunus, ligustrum, I think even willow, salix, maybe even oak quercus, maybe even ivy, Hedera helix. So it's a huge, 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 huge fat pickle of a sausage. Guys, I'm so happy right now. Do you see what I'm seeing? I was just checking my larva of Orizaba. As you can see here, the background, one is spinning a cocoon. So that's, uh, that's it, it's official. We have the first cocoon today. And if you want one breeding tip from me, I can give you the following tip. When you see a caterpillar spinning a cocoon, don't immediately grab it. A lot of breeders will have the urge or the intention to say, whoa, look, I have a cocoon and pull it off. But uh, don't, don't pull it off, okay? Give the larva some time to build a cocoon. Don't immediately take it off. Uh, that's not good. It's a very delicate process that can be disturbed if you are too eager. So um, it's never a good idea to uh, immediately harvest the cocoon. The, the silk is also very soft right now and fragile. And uh, we're going to give the larva some time to properly spin a cocoon and just slowly go into a pre-pupa and eventually pupate before we immediately harvest uh, the entire thing but uh, that's it it's our first cocoon can you see it oh yeah and it was about time because uh, i really cannot imagine these guys growing any bigger than this honestly that would be insane they're about the maximum size that they can get so i hope it's going to be a big beautiful moth Hey guys, how are you doing? I'm happy you're still watching my video after all this time. I hope you enjoyed the show so far. There's not many channels on YouTube who have content like this. So um, today I'm going to show you the progression. Here we have the cocoon. It has nicely formed up as you can see. So I'll just cut it loose here. Oop. It fell to the ground, but that's okay. It's actually quite uh, tough once you allow them to spin up for about a week. And here we have the first cocoon. See, it's a, it's a big cocoon. But there's other good news. I found today a second cocoon. And it's funny because this cocoon is literally hanging by the branch. Can you see it? Uh, I didn't do this. The larva did it himself or herself. Can you see? And um, in some rare occasions this happens in the wild too. Some Rosselias, they spin uh, this silk pad here. 
and the cocoons just hang hang by a thread here on the tree. Uh, I thought it was fascinating. It reminds me of a giant robin moth cocoon, Hyalophora cacropia, although it's uh, well, they, they are somewhat related, but uh, not not extremely related. But uh, just look at that. And that, this is a good quality cocoon, guys. I'm happy. So let's see the progress. All right, all right, guys. So I did a sneaky little count of how many caterpillars we have left. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven caterpillars left. Uh, is seven a lot? For another species, I would say no, but for this species, seven is a lot. It's a lot of work. These guys eat as much as, well, maybe 100 small caterpillars. And we have two cocoons. So that makes our total one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, with some luck, we will have nine cocoons. I know, I know, nine is not a lot. Um, perhaps I should have raised some more eggs. But I think there's a fair chance to have a pairing with nine cocoons. Uh, as long as the moths hatch at the same time, there's a good chance there will be a male and a female. Give me a high five, bro. I know you want to. Here's some facts about Rostilia triloba. It's a continuously brooded species found in Costa Rica, Panama and Nicaragua. Rostilia triloba is one of the bigger species of Saturnidae from Central America. For a long time it was considered to be a subspecies of Rostildia oritzaba. Old records often mention them as Rostildia oritzaba triloba, but recent research split them into separate species. Indeed, it is true that Rostildia triloba and oritzaba are similar looking species, but it's possible to separate them. In the triangular transparent wing windows, or fenestra, the edges are straight in true oritzaba but cur curved in triloba. Secondly, triloba is brighter in color than oritzaba. Thirdly, it seems triloba is continuously brooded while oritzaba is more inclined to diapause, potentially due to a stronger difference in dry and wet seasons in their habitat. In captivity, Rothschildia triloba is simple to breed to any hobbyist that has basic experience with the Saturnidae. The larvae grow and adults can be impressively big although it's a challenge to raise them to their full size because in captivity dwarfism seems to happen fast with this species in the wild they feed on several types of Arealia sea such as Aralia schleferea Lassistema sea such as Lassistema and most likely more plants and shrubs in captivity they have proven to be exceptionally polyphagous feeding on plants families the Oleacea which is olive family Anacardia sea, which for example uh, includes pistachio, rosa sea, which includes the cherries, Altingia sea, salia sea, and more. Saturnid enthusiasts commonly raise these giants on privets or um, ligustrum or prunus or cherry. Okay, so there's another cocoon here. Oh, let's take it. There you go. Hey, what's up? This is your insect boy, Bart Coppens. Let me guess what you have. Uh, what I have, sorry. Woohoo! Cocoons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven and eight. Eight cocoons is what we produced. Eight cocoons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight cocoons. So this guy or girl, we can't just assume genders anymore in the current year. This guy, or girl, is the final caterpillar. The last one of its kind. For the rest have already spun cocoons. And this one uh, is still busy spinning its cocoon, I guess. But the uh, rest here looks healthy. Interestingly, the fresh cocoons, they look white. Silk is white. 
but as the cocoons become older they turn brown so uh, yeah let's just put this dude here back he has the whole cage to him or herself to xerself I don't know what pronouns there are for insects now <laughs> sorry for the politically incorrect humor I shouldn't do that that's very mean of me okay it's a nice channel about insects let's not do that so uh, yeah as soon as this one spins its cocoon I can finally clean the cage and uh, remove the setup may not seem like much huh but uh, this was hard work it was blood and sweat and tears guys this was really hard work these eight cocoons right here and um, according to my information this species should be continuously brooded brooded where it comes from um, so I'm guessing the cocoons should hatch between one and three months time whoops one and three months time should be usual for a big species like this to develop depends a bit on the temperatures of course they like warm temperatures and moisture Surely I hope that they will be successful and that they will have males and females at the same time. If we have bad luck, these are 8 females or 8 males. If we have good luck, it's like 4 males, 4 females, but you never know. It's random. So uh, pairing Saturnidae, it also really depends on luck. But uh, I'll just be happy to see the moth regardless if we pair them or not. So that will be very fun to see. Hope we can make it. The cocoons usually hatch in one to three months time, if kept warm. You can hatch them in a pop-up cage designed for insects. If you can, try and keep them humid as well, next to warm. And now a time skip. We have to uh, wait for the moths to come out. Skip, skip, skip time. Let's skip time once again. Oh my god, there it is, our first specimen of Rothschildia triloba, look how big it is, it's huge isn't it, this is one of the bigger species of Rothschildia. Yay, here's our first male specimen. Isn't he an absolute beauty? I worked very hard to film all of this. These moths can only live for a short while, usually two weeks or less. They are nocturnal and at night they can fly long distances following the pheromone trails of the females. Typical of Rostelia moths are the transparent windows in their rings called fenestra. In captivity they are not hard to pair on room temperature. Unfortunately, I was missing a female and waiting for one to hatch. But for that we need to wait and the emergence times of these moths can be a little bit sporadic and randomized. Now one thing that I really like about Rostelia moths is that they can get really big in some cases. Uh, of these guys, there's many species of them. I don't know how many species there are from the top of my head. I think it's like 30 of them or maybe more. I haven't checked. And they vary a lot in size. And some can be medium uh, range, but some of them can be absolute giants. Now this is Rothschildia triloba, this guy right here, a male. Uh, males are smaller than the females, so the girls are going to be even bigger. And um, personally, I really like the big species of this, uh, of this group. I would love to raise also Rothschildia aurota. 
there's a few others. Uh, I'm not sure which one is the biggest one, to be honest. I have to check my data. But uh, one thing is clear, and this, this dude right here is one of the bigger Rothschildian moths, as you can see. That's a really good size, isn't it? Skip, skip, skip time. Let's skip time once again. I was afraid that the male was going to die single, but we have good news everyone. A fresh female just hatched and she is amazingly beautiful. Look at this moth. Oh my gosh. She is incredible. So we had to wait for a female to finally hatch. The females are even larger than the males. They have a lighter rusty orange color. One female can lay up to a hundred eggs in some cases. Now it was my ambition to pair this female right here with a male if I had the opportunity to. However, there was a problem. The male was too old and in no condition to pair. His wings were already broken and he seemed to be missing claws on his legs. This was frustrating, but it happens. When it comes to breeding Saturnidae, one also needs a little bit of good luck sometimes. Once again, a time skip. Let's wait for more individuals uh, to come out. Guys, I have to report some good news and some bad news. The good news is the moths, they keep hatching. And as you can see behind me, we raised some big and beautiful specimens. In fact, this is the biggest specimen so far. And it just hatched. It's a beautiful Triloba female, as you can see. So that's great, right? Nothing to complain about. Well, there is one problem. They're all females. This is three females. And here is the male, the first one that hatched. As you can see, it's dead. It's absolutely dead. Can you see it? These moths, they only live for a very short time. And this male, he only lived for about 10 days, unfortunately. And in these 10 days, he wasn't able to pair. Now, I have three single ladies here. Uh, two very big females and one small female. And they're completely single and waiting for a male. But uh, if the male doesn't hatch anytime soon, it means the breeding project, well, it will not end in a pairing. It's not the end of the world, okay? I don't... I, 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 I aim to reproduce all the species that I have. That's my end goal as a breeder, is to produce more moths. But pairing also really depends on luck, sometimes. And a male and female ratio, that's completely random. So there is some randomness here involved. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Now I want to show you this uh, beautiful specimen here that just hatched. It's a really big female once again, it's super beautiful. So even if these uh, guys do not end up uh, pairing, I'm still very happy I had this experience that I could study the life cycle of this beauty. Of course, I'm very thankful for that and that I could show it to you on YouTube. Because uh, the show must go on and I'm really trying my hardest to make the best and most beautiful moth videos for you and show you your favorite species in captivity. And this, this giant moth could not be missing from my channel.
Skip, skip, skip time. Let's skip time once again. Hello there, friends. Guess what? Today, two more moths just hatched. And the good news, they look absolutely beautiful. And I think this is uh, going to bring our project to an end. The good news is that these specimens are gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. The bad news is I don't think we're going to have a pairing. Because these are again two females. This, the last specimen that hatched was also female. Okay, look, she's already dead. These moths, they don't live for a long time. They have no functioning mouth, so they cannot eat. So after a two, week or two, they run out of energy. And see this? This here is my last cocoon. This is the last cocoon of my Rothschildia project. And if, if, if this doesn't hatch in a few days and it is not a male, then it is over for this bloodline and we don't get a pairing. Uh, is that a bad thing? I would have preferred to have a pairing, of course. I mean, the goal of being a breeder is to produce more moths. But the truth is, when you breed moths, you don't always get a pairing. It also depends on a lot of luck. Because their, uh, their, their male and female ratios can be random. Uh, their hatching time can also be random. Sometimes they don't synchronize well in captivity. So, uh, and so far we've been a bit unlucky. Because uh, we had 8 cocoons. Or maybe more. I think we had 9 cocoons. And so far we had like, like only one male. And the rest were females. So that's kind of unfortunate. But like I said, it's all up to luck. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I don't think that this generation is going to continue. But it doesn't matter, because uh, I've shown you the moths on YouTube. I've shown you how to raise them. And uh, maybe next time I can try again and uh, see if we can have a pairing. That would be cool. And uh, if not, I'm going to be happy anyways. Because they are really gorgeous moths here. Look at this female here on top. This one, she is, she's really big and beautiful. Can you see it? This is a really big female. Look at the color. Super amazing species, isn't it? I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm a really privileged guy to be able to do this, because I happen to live in a country where all of this is legal. If you live in the United States, for example, or in in Russia, in Brazil, in India. In the tropics, it's illegal for you to import animals like these. And I just happen to live in a country where the law is very relaxed. So where the, the government allows me to keep species like these. And uh, for that, I'm really blessed. And uh, that's why I want to show you with all of them on YouTube, of course, for the people who cannot do this. So you still have opportunity to see them in high definition, your favorite insects. So... Uh, Wow, super amazing. Skip, skip, skip time. Let's skip time once again. Super good news everyone. The last cocoon just hatched and it's a male. A male is exactly what I needed, wasn't it? Because the last two were females. So now it is time to introduce the specimen to the females and finally complete the life cycle, guys. Let's take the females so we can breed them. Wait, what? Oh my god, I can't believe this. Look at the state of the female. And look at the state of this other female. Yep, they're dead. So let me talk to you about one of the most annoying and common problems when you're breeding silk moths. That is their frustratingly short lifespans. Here in my left hand, obviously dead, I am holding the females, or rather what is left of the females, because as you can see, 
they uh, break their rings, they shred their rings and they die. In about a span of, of two weeks they look like this, all dead and dried out. And it's annoying that these females are dead. It's because this male here, this male here hatched three weeks after the females. And in considering the fact these animals only live for about 10 days, that's far too long. In captivity, it has happened a lot of times that I fail to spare a species simply because the males and females never hatch at the same time. With Saturnid moths this is frustratingly common, especially if they uh, hatch sporadically from their cocoons. So that makes it just more unpredictable. And if you have bad luck in some cases, the males uh, or females hatch weeks after their potential partners have already died. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty much a gamble at this point. It really is a gamble. Since we did not manage to pair this species in captivity and continue the bloodline, do you care for a small biology lesson? I bet you do. Are you looking for a species to impress your friends with? Rostilia triloba is a good choice. A Central American species of Rostilia with a fascinating life cycle and impressive wingspan. This species has been recorded in Costa Rica, Panama and Nicaragua. Here it lives in low to medium level elevation. This usually means from the lowlands to elevations up to 1500 meters. They have been recorded on higher altitudes than 1500 meters too, although this is quite rarely so. They seem to stick to the warmer regions in the lower elevations. Reportedly they are continuously or near continuously brooded, producing many generations a year without a pause, potentially around three generations a year. It is a true rainforest species. In these forests, the females lay eggs on several types of plants and shrubs from the families Anacardiaceae, Berseraceae, Euphorbiaceae, Araliaceae, Moraceae, Rosaceae, Rubiaceae and Saliaceae. A fun fact is that up until somewhat recently, Rostilia triloba used to be a subspecies of Rostilia orizaba. As such, in all literature and books, the species will be referred to as Rostilia orizaba triloba. They were split in 2012 in a publication by Brechlen and Meister titled New Species of the Genus Rostilia was published in the journal Entomosat Sphingia. Now there are a few ways to tell Orizaba and Triloba apart, although it is difficult. First of all, it appears that the triangular wing frames or the fenestra have more inwardly curved sides when it comes to the specimen of Rostilia triloba. Just compare the shape of the transparent windows on their wings a little bit and you'll notice that the edges of Orizaba are straighter than the curved edges of um, Triloba. Please note though, this can also vary per individual moth. It is said that the nominate Orizaba is found in Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, while Triloba is found in Costa Rica, Nicaragua and Panama. Clearly, there is a little bit of overlap in countries but the distribution of the nominate Orizaba is much more further north than Triloba, for example. In the most northern range of its distribution, Triloba is absent where Orizaba flies. Please keep in mind that Rostilia Orizaba used to have many subspecies that are now elevated to full species status, such as Orizaba equatorialis from Colombia and Ecuador, or Rostilia orizaba peruviana found in Peru, Ecuador and potentially Bolivia, which have been elevated to species level status, but I will try not to discuss these other different subspecies and speculate whether or not they deserve to have a full species status, 
because that would turn my video into a huge taxonomical debate and make my example unnecessarily complicated. This is when, when I refer to Rostilia orizaba, I only refer to the nominotypical subspecies of Rostilia orizaba, which is Rostilia orizaba orizaba. And clearly, their distributions are different. Reportedly, Rostilia triloba is continuously brooded, while the nominotypical orizaba experience a diapause because Oritzaba have a distribution further north, even up to Mexico, it's more important for them to be able to cope with the stronger dry seasons. Ostialia triloba is more bright orange, while Oritzaba is darker in ground color. Last but not least, there are altitude differences. I quote from a very trusted source, the nominate subspecies of Rostilia orizaba flies at elevations of 1500 to 2200 meter, possibly significantly lower in Veracruz, Mexico, definitely lower in Atlantida, Honduras in Central America, Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa Rica and Panama. Now please keep in mind that altitude is not set in stone but it is rather tied to the microclimate. The higher the altitude, usually the less intense the temperatures tend to be, for example. Orizaba is usually found from 1500 meters up to 2200 meters in elevation and higher according to my sources, but I also have information that implies they've been recorded above 2200 meters in some localities. This is usually because of their um, comfort zone when it comes to temperatures. Now, Rostildia triloba rarely get higher than 1500 meters, however, and their populations seem to occur at lower altitudes. Even if the two species were present in the same locations, they would rarely meet each other, since triloba occurs in the lowlands and mid-level elevation, and trilo and orizaba from mid to high level elevations. Please keep in mind though, that in some localities where the microclimate is colder, both species can occur at lower altitudes than as usual, although both species still retain their differences when it comes to their comfort zone in relation to temperatures. This species is reportedly a true rainforest species. Therefore, forest ecology should play an important role in the conservation of this marvelous insect. It very much prefers warm and humid environments. Reportedly, populations of these moths tend to be low in density when caterpillars, uh, with caterpillars and cocoons scattered throughout several different shrubs and trees in the forest. Think about location. Do you see this moth here? This is another species named Rostildia aurota. As you can see, it looks similar to Triloba and Orizaba. In reality, many, many species of Rostildia exist on this planet that are visually quite similar and can be very hard to distinguish from other species. But as you can see, this species only flies in Venezuela, Bolivia, Brazil, Guyana, Suriname, French Guiana, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru and Argentina. While it looks similar, there is zero chance for this species to ever be confused with Triloba in the wild, because they all come from different countries. This is perhaps the most important thing to remember. Always write down the location of any species you are trying to identify or breed. Here are some more examples of various Rostildia moths. If I were to give you a random unnamed specimen without telling you the location where it comes from, would you be able to identify the species? The truth is, you would probably not be able to identify it without knowing its geographical origin. I know some overconfident people that um, would disagree with this, but I doubt that they are right. In, fi in fact, there are a lot of Rostildia species that are described on the basis of small differences in their DNA and genitalia, and their genitalia, but that may visually not be that different from each other at all. Next to DNA, genitalia, morphology and their ecology, the main thing that separates them is their localities. Many subspecies and species are separated from each other geographically or occupy certain altitudes, habitats or localities that separate them from other species of Rostilia moths. 
Location, people. Location, 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 location is super important. And I cannot stress this enough. In this case, with all these similar looking moths that I'm showing you right now, there is zero chance of them being confused in the wild. Rocilia gyris is from Peru and Bolivia. Rocilia ariana is from Argentina. Rocilia sanimaciana is from Durango and maybe Sinaloa and Mexico. So in this plate, there are already three species that do not even occur in the same countries. And there's about zero chance of them being taken from the same location. Rostildia hesperus and aurota do occur in the same countries, since they are Amazonian species found in the Amazon forests, which includes Ecuador, Venezuela, French Guiana, Guyana, Suriname, Brazil, Colombia and Peru, for example. However, upon close examination, we discover that Rostildia aurota only flies around the eastern slopes of the Andes mountains. Rostildia hesperus does not. And hesperus is found far away from the Andes mountains. In fact, even, even up to Cal, um, which is a location in French Guiana, for example, which is about 150 kilometers away from the eastern coastline. An enormously different distribution compared to Rostildia erota. Because Rostildia erota is a species that only seems to hug the eastern slopes of the Andes mountains. And then we have Roskildia orizaba, a species with a complicated taxonomy, if you ask me, since it, has a lot, since it has a lot of subspecies, some of which were elevated to full species status and others may follow in the future. But as I mentioned before, the nominotypical subspecies of, uh, of orizaba flies at elevations of 1500 to 2200 uh, meters in Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa Rica and Panama. I'm not exact exactly sure if Orizaba can overlap with the very limited range of the Sunny Marciana, but even then, despite showing you six different species right here, it would be the first case where we would actually have to identify the moths by their morphology, DNA, genitalia, instead of by locations. But as you can see, I have clearly explained right now, it's very easy to separate Rostialia species by geographical locations, while it can be super hard to separate species just based on their looks. Oh, you have no location? Dummy! No location means no reliable identification in my opinion. I see a lot of breeders and collectors sell material of Rostildia moths without a geographical origin. That's quite foolish in my opinion because it's very hard to be sure of the species without a location. In fact, even if the species is easily identified, a lot of them have unique subspecies with different traits that are also important to take notes of. And this information is lost in captivity if you don't have any data. Please make sure to write down where the animals originally come from. Before you ask, yes, I did cut my hair, okay? Thank you for watching the video. This was Bart Coppens with Rostildia triloba. Rearing them was a success. Pairing them was not a success. Truth is, if you want to breed the Saturnidae, the silk moths, a lot of it depends on your skill and ability to raise them. But a lot also depends on luck and randomness. If you want to be a successful breeder, you don't, don't just have to be a skilled breeder. You also have to be a lucky breeder. Especially with creatures that randomly hatch from their cocoons. The male to female ratio is also completely random. You cannot influence how many of them are male and how many of them are female. Uh, it's hard to influence um, their emergence time sometimes and make them hatch at the same time. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Am I not satisfied? Well, actually, I'm very happy that we managed to complete the life cycle. It was a big success, of course. We managed to make a nice video. We captured the life cycle of an awesome insect. Would have been better if I had a pairing, though. The point of breeding insects is that you produce more of them, not less. So this time I wasn't able to produce more moths. I guess that's a shame. 
but uh, it's it's inevitable that it happens sometimes. Thank you for watching. Did you enjoy it? Bye bye. Last but not least, I want to say that YouTube does not support my videos and my YouTube channel is demonetized. I don't make any money from the videos I upload, unlike other YouTubers. This problem makes it difficult for me to keep this channel going because I invest a lot of my free time and effort in my videos. The kind of content that I make is expensive because it requires me to have loads of free time to film and edit and I need a lot of materials to breed my insects. If this YouTube channel is important for you, please consider becoming my supporter on Patreon or tipping me money through PayPal or LiberaPay. The options can be found in the descriptions of my video. I use the donations that I make online to produce new videos. Because being a YouTuber like me is very hard to combine with a full-time job, especially if you have to film the life cycle of moths that take several months to complete in captivity. The more people support my channel, the better my videos will become in the future. My channel runs entirely on donations from my fans and supporters. Thank you for listening and goodbye. I hope to see you next time.